right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Rana Kadori, who is in Sydney. How are you doing? I'm awesome. How are you, John? Excellent. I'm very good. And, um, and what we want to talk about today is Rana's, uh, Rana's whole uh, approach to selling and coaching. So she coaches salespeople, helps, helps corporations uh, with their sales team. And she's on a mission to help people fall in love with sales. Right? And let's face it, um, that is a noble undertaking, um, but one that maybe isn't as easy as we would like it to be. Because let's be honest. Um, there are some people who go, go into sales deliberately and make a choice to go into sales, but there's a lot of people who default into sales uh, and that's where they end up and they go in there and they feel a little bit uneasy by being a salesperson because of the popular culture and the, the perception of salespeople as, you know, as pushy and sleazy and slimy and all that, all that, all that nonsense. Cause that's face it at the end of the day, that's how they've been portrayed in, in movies and in popular culture. So, so Rana, when you start to work with salespeople, how do you help people, how do you help salespeople to start to see themselves as professionals who are doing a noble job as opposed to people who are, as I said, kind of defaulted in the, into this job and are kind of a little embarrassed by it? Okay, so there are three ways that I do that. Number one is I teach them the difference between a pushy salesperson and an ethical trusted advisor. So I talk to them about the differences. Uh, so such as a pushy salesperson, all they do is talk. A trusted advisor, they ask lots of questions and find out if there's gaps. A pushy salesperson is all about the outcome. Um, a consultative advisor, it's all about how can they make a difference in the customer's life. So once they understand the differences, that takes the pressure off. That They don't have to be like the Wolf of Wall Street type of selling. Mm -hmm. Number two, then I talk to them about, so what are the benefits of knowing how to sell? And I get them to explore. They say, you know, I can influence my kids to eat that broccoli or I can get that promotion or I can, you know, become more confident. I can have a great mindset. So once they identify the benefits, then step number three, they need to identify the impact they're making. So then we explore what is the impact you're making? not just to yourself as a salesperson making lots of commission, which is great. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a, a great lifestyle and you're going to keep your job. But what is the um, impact that you're making to your customers? So let's talk about how is your product or service going to change their lives for the better? And what is the impact you're making to the economy? Because if you don't sell, and I know this mm -hmm. might sound harsh, we're going to, in the company you're working with, they're going to have to cut jobs, right? So we have to think about our colleagues, the company, and the more we can sell, the more jobs we create. So that's the three ways I help them. And then sometimes, you know what, there many times they're like, okay, yes, I want to sell. Like they get excited about it. And then obviously yeah. I then teach them about confidence and how to feel confident. And that's a whole nother, another strategy as yeah. well. So, let, so let's go back to the first one there where you talk about, okay, actually uh, moving from being a, 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 somebody who talks a lot, who pushes a product to somebody who's a trusted advisor. That means you, you have to help teach listening skills and discovery skills, right? How to mm -hmm. ask intelligent questions and then how to um, elicit feedback from the prospect and actually get them to talk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as you know, being a sales professional yourself, um, the discovery is probably the most important aspect of the sales process. And I have many sales managers or VPs of sales coming to me saying, I need you to teach my guys how to close or how to mm -hmm. get the sale. And I'm like, no, number one, we need to teach them how to open the sale. And number two, the discovery. And many times they're like, what is the discovery? Or yeah, we know the discovery, but we want to pitch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. That discovery what is important. Yeah, because I think unfortunately we live in a culture today where everything, everybody wants everything immediately and fast, and, and uh, you know, so it's like, oh, let's let's go in immediately and then propose or pitch. So then, either they're going to buy or we can move on to the next one, as opposed to, and and when you do that, you miss the opportunity of number one, you may spend a lot of time on opportunities that are never going to close because they weren't the right ones in the first place, or you may actually qualify out opportunities that have a huge potential if you actually did the discovery. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I mean, it's human nature that we think that we know the solution or if we've been working with a specific niche for a long time. And it's hard for me, like this week I was on a few sales calls trying to close my business, uh, my deals and the specific niches that I knew inside out, they all have some similar problems. And it was hard for me to ask the same questions and hear the same answers again. But sometimes there's specific answers that I might miss. There's gaps, specific gaps that I might, for example, one sales, like I know that the biggest obstacle is getting on the phone and calling. And most of my sales yeah. is like cold calling. But one guy said he wants, Lucky I asked him because I would have sent him the proposal all about cold calling. He said he, all he wants is them to stop getting on the phone, go out door knocking. He wants them to go out. And, you know, just because I asked him the questions, I was mm -hmm. able to put in my proposal, I can teach you how to go out cold canvassing. Yeah, and I think that's a great, I think that's a, fan, that's a fantastic example because, yeah, it can become, it can become tempting because you know, you recognize the type of prospect and you think they're all kind of the same. It's going to be the same. They're all looking for the same thing pretty much. And as you say, I mean, you could easily miss out, miss out on, on something there. I think one of the other things to pick up on what you said about this idea of, uh, of service, of the fact that, I mean, that in reality is what a salesperson is. It's a con, they're a conduit. They're bringing, they're helping to bring you a product or service that's going to help solve a need or, or, uh, or, or create an opportunity for you. So it is, it, it's a great, it's a great role to play. It's, and, and I think that's making people understand that I think can change the whole dynamic of their job. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And it does change the dynamic, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and nowadays, especially, I mean, I think the part of the thing is that, um, you know, I think people crave a lot of authenticity and, um, and empathy and things like that. So, so when you work with, when you work with salespeople, how do you help them to be more empathetic maybe, and to be more, um, you know, I, I see you, you, you talk about, you know, um, emotion, you know, EQ as well, right? Um, so how do you help people be, be more authentic, be more uh, attuned to what's going on with their prospect? So, I mean, it's very simple. It's imagine that you were the prospect. How would you like, say in the pandemic right now, you've, you've mm. just, you're just losing your business, you're in a place of uncertainty. When someone calls you a salesperson, how would you like that phone call to go? Would you like that phone call to go? How, how are you going? Is there anything we can do to support you? Um, and ask questions to find out about their experience. Maybe use it as research just to find out what's going on with businesses like this. Um, or maybe send them out a box of chocolate, a card. Or would you like somebody to call you and try and close you and try and ask you if there's any opportunities? So if you were that customer, how would you like to be treated? And it's, it's that simple. That's where the empathy mm -hmm. starts. And I mean, obviously, we can go further into Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence and it all starts with self-awareness once you're mm -hmm. self-aware and that how you're like in a selling situation are you really many times we're not empathetic sometimes when we're thinking about closing the sale or we've got our targets to hit and we have pressure pressure from the managers or if you're an entrepreneur you don't know if you're going to be able to pay your uh wages next month it's hard to have empathy but yeah. if you don't start with being authentic and having empathy and caring um, you're going to be out of business very soon or out of a job very soon because people can tell about who cares for, about them and who doesn't care about them as well. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a, I think that's a very, very good point to make because, and then especially now, because P, I'd said that extra level of, of sensitivity and genuine sensitivity too, because, you know, as you say, I mean, who knows, you don't know how people's businesses are, are hurting right now. So you need to have that extra level of sensitivity while at the same time, you have enormous pressure on yourself. So it, it is such a balancing act. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there's a lot of pressure. And sometimes it's hard to have empathy when the customer goes to you or don't reply to your um, mm -hmm. messages or emails. And, you know, it's hard to have empathy. But also, I put myself in the issues when I, there's a product that I want to buy. And I actually had a conversation with this guy. But he's been, he emailed me three follow-ups and I've been so busy. Like, I'm someone that gets a lot of junk mail as well. Sure. So his mm -hmm. email went down like, I don't know, <laughs> went down like 50 emails down. So the last priority for me is getting to his email. So if he follows up with me a fourth time, possibly I'm going to respond to him. But he might think, okay, she's just ghosting me or she's just blowing me off. But at the end of the day, if you put yourself, if you're a buyer and you've ever been a buyer 
And you mm -hmm. think about how many times have you not responded to someone because you're busy or maybe you're not interested or whatever mm. as well. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a good point, and I think that's I think that's a a point just to underline is because sometimes we forget, right, and that we're all consumers and we're all buyers, in, and then when we walk through the door, we suddenly forget that when we turn into when we get into selling mode, we forget what it's like to be a to be a buyer. And just yeah. to your point, and just to underline your point there, uh, I had somebody I, I was talking to somebody recently about a, about a, providing a service uh, to us here. I had a couple of calls with them, negotiated and all that, that said, you know, send it over. And then to your point, I got really busy with other stuff. And so they sent a follow up and, you know, I, and unfortunately I didn't get to that either. And they sent a follow up and, and it was actually the fourth follow up. I was like, oh yeah, I had every intention of doing it all along. I just was so caught up in other things. So, but if that person had given up, um, I maybe have forgotten about it in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it's actually also um, they don't. A lot of these people don't actually pick up the phone. Mm -hmm, so yeah. I think they have like some of these people have never actually called me. Right. It was through email that I saw. Yeah, they were sending me um, cold emails, but then it was something that I um, really wanted out of the many. I don't just buy anything, but sure. so they were just going back and forth in email, and I'm thinking, why don't you just pick up the phone? Like it just takes a second. I'm and also I'm not an email person mm -hmm. or a messaging person. Uh, and you see there, I, and I love you brought that up actually, Rana, because there's another great, uh, there's another great um, nugget of wisdom. There is, you need to when you you need to communicate with people how they want to be communicated with, That's not what's point, most yeah. con not what's most convenient to you. And um, somebody gave me an example of this recently. They said they were it was actually a sales coach. They said they were doing uh, last year they were doing a ride along with the salesperson in a car, and the salesperson uh, texted or said something like, or, or the person, yeah, the, 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 the prospect or customer texted them and said, okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. Can you send whatever to me? And the salesperson immediately called them. And the, the prospect was a little put out by that. Mm -hmm. and, and the coach turned around and said, why didn't you text him back? and say, even ask, is it okay to call you? Or do you want to continue yeah. this conversation through text? So he actually, by, by immediately calling them, uh, mm. he actually put, put it on the, on the wrong footing because that, and in your point there, if somebody is, is emailing you and you're not responding, then why aren't they trying to call you just to see? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Preferred. And that's a good point because some people, they don't want to talk on the phone. They just mm -hmm. avoid it and they, they're happy to communicate. So it's important not to communicate the way we like to be communicated to yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always a good idea to, and, and somebody asked me like, well, what's the best way of finding that out? And I said, well, the best way is probably just asking the person, <laughs> you know, how yeah, you and I mean, yeah. Yeah. And also you don't want to come across too desperate either. So there's a fine yeah. line between following up and the way you call. And if they don't answer, yeah. like not just if they're calling them five more times. Yeah. As well. No, no. Absolutely. Um, so in your work with, with, when you work with companies and that, um, what are some of the transformations you have seen uh, from taking a, a sales force of maybe people who weren't as confident or, or um, feeling as good about themselves and moving them to uh, a much more kind of pride and greater level of pride and professionalism? Um, okay, so there's... One or two stories that I can that, uh, like stay in my yeah. mind because I, I felt like really emotional when the manager was telling me this story because mm -hmm. emotional is like, oh, wow, I was, I felt a sense of accomplishment, achievement, and like what I'm doing is making a difference. Mm -hmm. One lady, um, so I went out and taught uh, just a day of sales. It wasn't actually even my program. It was just that one day of sales training. And mm -hmm. one lady, apparently, two years later, I had a conversation with her manager because I sold her manager a program and she said, Yes, like I want to buy from you because I remember, and I'm going to change the name of her. Sure. Yeah, of course. And I actually thought like this person was, okay, she said, remember Maggie? Yeah, I remember Maggie. She uh, really stood out in the training. She said, do you know she was on the verge of losing her job? But after mm -hmm. your training, she basically started excelling and she got promoted and now she's a top performer. Um, and that wasn't even a, like usually I have programs of implementation. I don't really... Um, so I like sometimes I get surprised when people go to one training and they, but sure, I guess yeah. they, they take, uh, there was another one where um, I was doing the whole program three months, doing the coaching and, you know, being on site. And the manager said, 
nostalgia you know nostalgia yeah you know she hated cold calling she used to like want to cry before getting on and now she comes up to me and she says i love cold calling and she said thank you so much so wow. yeah and i think stories like that make me feel and sometimes these people don't even tell you but when their manager comes mm -hmm. and tells you it's like even better as well yeah so those are those are um those are great examples i think uh for people to to understand about the fact is that sometimes it's it's not that you so you say you hate cold calling right maybe it's not that you hate cold calling you hate cold calling the way you're cold calling today you've mm -hmm. never been trained properly in how to cold call effectively you don't feel confident and then of course and if you don't know if you don't really know what you're doing and you haven't been trained and you're not confident in it my goodness of course you're going to hate it so i think these are great lessons for for companies and organizations is that if you don't train your people properly you're going to get the results. And you're so right, John, because some of these companies have never had uh, one day of training with their staff mm. ever. And it yeah. might surprise you, but um, like a lot of people have, have not had sales training because all they do is like, they have this, okay, this is how you do it. Or you have sales experience, that's great, come in. and. Yeah. But there are some companies, they're great. They actually have every, almost daily, once a week sales training internally, which is so important, the repetition. Yeah. It is and, and role playing and stuff like that to to make sure you train because yeah, because it's one thing to say hit the phones right I need you to make five, you know, 500 million calls per day dials per day. But it's an entirely different thing to say okay I'm actually going to train you in how to be the most effective person you can be on the call and also we're going to figure out the target and all that kind of stuff. But there's, there's, it's no wonder it's too often we just play a numbers game. Yeah. Yeah, and there's no um, quality, there's no uh, no qualifying, no creating an ideal customer profile, no knowing how to build a pipeline, work a pipeline, qualify in or out or nurture. Like, So what they're doing is they have this pipeline, but it's always cold and they're just chasing cold leads mm -hmm. until they get worn out as well. Yeah, yeah, I used to call that the, uh, the feel good funnel is when you stuff like, funnel, yeah. St yeah, it's when you like stuff <laughs> when you stuff stage one with tons and tons of opportunities because it makes you feel good. It makes you look at the size of my pipeline. Now, the fact that you're not closing anything at the end of it, you say, Oh yeah, no, that's your manager. Oh yeah. Don't worry because in two months I'm going to close all of this business and look, and then what happens two months later, you've still got a huge, uh, early stage. And again, you're not closing anything and you're going, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But wait another two months. <laughs> That, that's brilliant. I mean, I've never heard that. I'm going to, I'll, I'll quote, obviously I'll give you credit, but feel good <laughs> funnel. I just wrote it down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John no, says. yeah and the, there you go. And, and that's, and that's very, very typical. We do because as you pointed out, uh, uh, because um, I think I was reading on your side about the whole idea is, you know, you've got to focus on the early stages where you can bring value and that's where managers and that's where, and we were talking about qualifying earlier because it's better to have less in your pipeline that's highly qualified than it is to have all this stuff that makes you feel good, but it's never going to close. That's so true. And even um, the same applies for uh, sales meetings. Like even me personally, I, the uh, level of sales meeting I have to somebody else that's closing the size of my deals in the industry that I do it's very small compared to like one lady was bragging. She has like 30 appointments a week doing what I do. And I'm like, how do you even have time to do the coaching and selling? And number yeah. two, you're probably just having appointments just with anybody and you're not even qualifying. She wasn't yeah. actually a sales coach. Otherwise she wouldn't have done that. I think she was like a life, no, a business leadership coach. That's it. Right. Cause right. I think a sales right. expert would know, like would know no. that, that <laughs> you don't do yeah. that, but let's no, just have exactly. coffee with everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, and being, you know, you have to do the delivery and you have to do other work and stuff. So you have to be, I mean, for, for people like in your role, you have to be highly disciplined in qualifying your opportunities, right? Yeah, I mean, I still like sometimes I get comfortable because I do have a lot of leads and a lot of business and, mm -hmm. you know, they all come to me, but I, not all, but mostly because I've been doing this for seven years. But when I first started, I um, went all across Australia on my own like i mean with my own funding and went door knocking to the businesses i wanted i created a whole niche of specific mm -hmm. businesses i door knocked on hundreds of places outside of my state um i offered lots of free training and also i got on the phone and called thousands and thousands of businesses i got lots of rejection and i even um 
spent hundreds of dollars on stamps, like a thousand dollars on stamps and like printing, sending all these flies out. I didn't get anywhere with it, but maybe I did because it's all marketing. You don't know. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, that's what, so if you're building a pipeline, it's important to understand that's the level that you need to go to. Of course you have to do marketing and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. too. And then you might get to my stage seven years later where you're comfortable, you're getting referrals, you're known. So when I send a cold email now, a lot of times they actually respond because they say, I know your work. I've seen your work within that industry, by the way, it's not even like anything sure. to do with LinkedIn. It's actually within a specific industry. And some of this, if I'm not on LinkedIn or even online, it's just right. that it's a word of mouth. Yeah. And you see that that's fantastic because I do think that um, that's a good reminder too about, you know, putting in the, putting in the hard work, because again, we live in this culture, the shortcut culture and people think, Oh, well, you know, prospecting is, as you said, prospecting is just going on LinkedIn, finding some people and then blasting them with in mail messages. No, there, I'm, just there, don't even I'm just done. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, well, and I, and, and I have to say, I mean, I've even reduced mine, um, uh, uh, my activity on LinkedIn because I'm tired of getting cold in mails constantly. Yeah, I mean, look, I shouldn't talk because I do have a lot of connections on LinkedIn, a lot. And it wasn't even, um, into, so a lot of these people are following me because I do post a lot of things. Sure. So it's not it's not thing people I connected with because I do connect within my niche and geography. Um, but at the same time, yeah, LinkedIn works. But if you just rely and a lot of people, they're like, let me show you this LinkedIn strategy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. do you know, I get so many uh, sales messages on LinkedIn and sometimes I might not log in for a week. But if yeah. you and I know like LinkedIn, yeah, you've got your picture, your brand, whatever. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people on LinkedIn are actually selling or looking for a job. Email get on the phone, door knock. Those are my three favorites. And I love doing email marketing as well, which is the marketing side of things, yeah. sending them all the articles and videos as well. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, you need to have, a, you need to have, you need to be doing more than one thing and, uh, and certainly not just defaulting to the one that seems like the easiest. You can do the highest volume with the least effort often doesn't result in much to be perfectly honest. Yeah. And I'm not knocking LinkedIn, by the way, no, no, it, no. Can, it can work. That's where you find decision makers. And that's where you do a lot of the research through LinkedIn Sales sure. Navigator. Um, it's yeah. amazing for that. Yeah, the no, game. it is amazing for that. It's just unfortunate that, uh, you know, that some people are, are using it as a spamming tool. But hey, there's yeah, people who I mean, abuse I, everything. I, I mean, there are some people that are selling specific courses, telling people do not make a cold call again, because I'm going to show you how to use LinkedIn. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like, what are you doing? You're using people's uh, fears of cold calling to sell them something that is not 100% part of a sales cadence. Yeah, no, it is it, true. Because that's not a hard sell if you say to people, oh, I can, I can, I can show you something and you never have to cold call again. You'll never have to pick up the phone and do a cold call. I mean, there's a lot of people who are going, fantastic, show me now. But as you say, yeah. you're, all, you're, all you're doing is just playing on their, their, their reticence to do it in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so listen, this has been great, uh, Rana. So Rana Kurdahi, um, all of Rana's information is going to be below this video here. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself, what you do and how they can find out more about you. So I've got an organization called the Selling Academy, and it's the umbrella of something called Employment Services Training, which trains our recruiters and people in government um, recruitment and employment services in sales. And I also um, have the Selling uh, selling for Non-Sales People, which specifically teaches non-sales people how to sell. I've been in sales for 20 years. I've done all sorts of sales. I kind of fell into work because I think um, I was... I think I was good at teaching, I guess, also mm. the teaching part and also the selling part. So I feel like I'm bragging now. I'm not yes. that good. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Um, hey. Yeah, so I, I fell into that. Uh, and that's it. If you want to find more about me, yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or all my details are, are what John Golden's going to put. But you know, by the way, I'm actually envious of your name, John Golden. Like it's such <laughs> a good branding name. It's a name that you won't forget. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, I'd like to take credit for it, but really, my dad would have to do that, or his dad, or however, wherever it yeah. goes from there. Um, no, that's fantastic. I know, not bragging at all. I, I'm a firm believer. You, you need to be your biggest cheerleader. So there you go. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. My Thanks name is John Gold.
Yeah, thank you for joining us today uh, from lovely Sydney. Hopefully, when all of this pandem pandemic is over, hopefully we'll get back to Australia soon. Yes. Um, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.